with the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-host, partner in crime, the doctor, Jimmy Butchalato. Hi, everyone. Jimmy. Hey, now. Uh, big, big episode. Very excited for uh, everybody on our side of the border in the United States to hear from Ken Pereira, who former union boss in Canada. Uh and is really one of the true good guys in the fight against organized crime. Um, I mean, I would say globally because of the, the group in Montreal has, has such a, a global reach and he was a, a, you know, a whistleblower who got up on the stand and helped. I, I don't want to say rid, but make a dent in labor racketeering corruption in Montreal. He was a star witness at the Charbonneau Commission hearings. Ken Pereira, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, by the way, I, I, I've been listening to you guys for a while. I love your show. Thank and uh, what I'm going to say today, I think it goes directly with the original gangster team because Montreal, in my opinion, is the original gangster city. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's part of the top amen, five amen. or six. I think so. I really do, you know. And it's it's roots. Uh, we could say have, it's a great city. The great people, but we have a lot of roots with organized crime. And uh, if you mind, I'll just go through it a bit. So until we touch my my little testimony. Yeah, you mean you, go, why don't yeah, you go just ahead, go from your perspective? Uh, All right, and, and you know from your from from your roots, you know, where, well, where, you, where you came up and what do you see? I was born in the East End of Montreal, you know, in the, in the East End. I was right. And I went to an English school. And in that time, all the English schools were closing because, you know, there was a law that passed 101 and you had to go to a French school at a certain age and a certain time. So I was one of the guys who went to an English school and 80 to 90 percent of the school was from Italian origin. And at that time, nobody went to private school. So the rich Italian and the poor Italian was all mixed together. And with guys like me, uh, Portuguese descendants, French Canadians, English and all that. But the majority were Italian. I lived right near St. Leonard, which is uh, a melting but, pot of yeah. enormous Italians, right? Yeah, and from both both regions, from Sicily and from the main the main uh, the main core, main Italy. So uh, we, I was lucky or unlucky. I had even Catroni who lived on my street. So you know, so it, it's like uh, I went to school with Di Malo. Uh, I had, and these are all names, but it's yeah. all names that maybe we're gonna go a bit further yeah. in to find out. So, so I knew. I knew a lot of these little Italian bars, you know, when you grow up, we, we used to call them pharmacies, you know, because <laughs> they weren't bars. They used to sell uh, other things than than just alcohol. You know, they had these refrigerators. They had these these places to make food, but none of them were uh, were working. It was just a front. So the cops would let them sell. Uh, the government would let them sell, uh, you know, uh, uh, drinks and alcohol and put some machines there. So they so you you live in this area, you know, a lot of these people, you find out what they are. And then slowly and surely, you know, uh, I become I, I follow my father. My father is uh, a construction worker, started his own company. We're in the mill rights, which is mechanical industrial mechanics so so we were mostly industrial we weren't in the residential we weren't in the civil construction here in quebec and in, in, in the states it's about the same thing you know it's different divisions so us it was just mainline industrial like refineries paper mills uh you know uh, chemical plants so that that was our main uh, main focus so we in a certain sense were a bit outside of the we could say the construction uh, genre, the construction um, idea of people saying this is all corrupt and all this. So I br I was brought up this way, and slowly and surely, because I don't know, I defended a lot of workers. Uh, the unions came and see me and said, "Hey Ken, you, you look like a guy who can stand up for us, and you will you will uh, 
you will, you will give us a little hand. You speak English, you speak French. There's a lot of contractors who are coming from the States. The big companies are installed there, are American. So you can be, a, you know, our man. And uh, if you want to and, you're, and you like what you're doing and if you still want to continue, well, you know, there's a there's a there's a avenue. There's a there's a livelihood with the union. So I liked it. I always liked defending people. I always liked it. But immediately I saw that. There's the good part of unions and there's the bad part of unions. To see exclusive bonus footage of this interview, sign up and become a member at patreon.com forward slash original gangsters. There's this, you know, the envelopes. <laughs> there's, there's shut up. Don't say anything. This guy is part of us. He's our friend. It's almost like a mob mentality. You know, it's like he's our friend. They use words, the specific words, mostly in French, but in English, the same thing to to tell you, hey, listen, you know, these guys are untouchable. This one, you want to hurt them? Don't worry about it. You want to stop? You want to you slow down the job? Go for it. So slowly and surely when you're young, you're, you're trying to make your roots. So you see all of these things, but you can't say anything because you don't have the power. You have absolutely no power. You're behind one, two, three, four, or five leaders in front of you. And you at 21, 22 years old, all you want to do is make money. Think about the, your, uh, your, your career and say, but in by my back of my head, I'm saying, whenever, if ever I have the chance of becoming a leader, I'm going to put a stop to this or to whatever I think I can help or advance. So that was my mindset for a lot of years, you know? And then I'm a, not an historian, but I like, I love Quebec because it has so many, sorry, man. Yeah, it, it has so many backstories that it gives you a great history. You know, <laughs> Quebec with the mob, we have the family, the Rizzutos. Okay, Catroni was there before, but Rizzuto is to anybody. He's maybe the number one or number two in the world, you know, at one point in the mob, right? I, I, maybe I'm I'm digressing, but, you know, he was so huge. You know, he, he invested $2 billion in a, in a, in a, in a bridge in Sicily, you know, he, is, he had tentacles everywhere. Then it, was mob, it, yeah. it, was tra- it was transnational exactly. at, a le- at a level that most, if not all American, you know, traditional United States crime families weren't. And it was for whatever reason, for whatever reason, kind of easily overlooked because for years it was perceived that they were uh, just a, a wing a, of the, of the a satellite. Exactly. Right. A satellite. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, just, just even when you speak, I heard you, you know, uh, on the Rizzutos and, you know, Paulo Violi, in my opinion, is a man who got killed. He was part of the mm-hmm. Catronis, but he was much closer, in my opinion, to a Gotti than a Rizzuto. You know, I mean, you know, he, he was flamboyant, you know, he but he, he was he stayed local. Rizzuto was huge. You know, he went to Venezuela, opened up enormous lines with the Contreras. You know, he had he had enormous power. And we I didn't see it at the beginning. I just saw it mostly at the end. And that's where. And then the Hells Angels with Mambushi, which was one of the top Hells Angels in the world. Then today with Marty Robert, which is if he's not number one, he's number two. But he's, you know, they're up there. And then the West End gang which controlled all our ports, you know, and we had the Ross and, and the Maddox and all this. And so, so Montreal was a melting Doody pot. Ryan, Doody, Ryan, Doody Ryan. Doody Ryan, exactly. And it was a melting pot of enormous power. And all these guys all got together because of one family was, was the Rizzutos. He had this knack of getting all these people together, you know, and eating all, all at the same table, which made him. Did, I think that was his biggest power. If, if uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, as qualified as other people, but I think that was his main, main power. He could sit down with anybody, and you know, and as long and make him feel like you know, you're going to have a bit of the plate. And there was no, no war really for a lot of years because he kept it stable, and he had, and, it, yeah. And I think it's. 
you don't have to qualify it by saying that's your opinion. I mean, I think it's pretty well established at this point and undisputed that what Vito Rizzuto was able to do for 20 years uh, of this delicate balance, threading this needle, uh, keeping everybody in this very volatile puzzle, all, getting all the pieces right. And then the second that he leaves the scene, it's like one little thread that you pull and the whole thing comes apart and it's just utter chaos now going on 15 years. So I, and he warned, but, he yes. warned law, he warned law enforcement that that would happen. Remember right. when, when he, he got was, off the, when he was getting on the plane, right. What's, which is, which is really incredible is because the policeman that's bringing him to the plane to send the extradite him to the States is Nicodermo Milano and Nicodermo Milano later because becomes my case agent at, uh, at the, the public inquiry. So right. I, I, I meet him and that's how I meet him also. So it's the first time we meet, but it's kind of everything uh, turns around, around what I'm going to start this, talking about. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Rizzuto knew exactly what he was saying. He knew exactly that it, at one point, there's one of my friends, who knew him pretty well and he says he, he used to always use the term vegetable soup he says a vegetable soup has a bunch of vegetables in it everything is perfect mix in it but if you add too much salt you're going to destroy that soup so he says i'm the one i'm the cook so yeah his terminology was kind of simple you know he says everybody has to eat everybody's going to be part of the plate we're all going to be part of it in different forms but I'm going, I'm the cook. And, uh, you know, it made sense in a while. So you got a bit, a bit of the history of Montreal. Uh, Montreal has been always, you know, a, a center plate. And, you know, a, a lot of port cities have a lot of crime around it. Or you know, And Montreal, mostly because of the speaking act aspect of it, was like the, the middleman between the Americans in New York and Marseille in in the, in the, in France because they were doing their heroin and they were sending it. So that's how Catroni and all that started. And so they wanted people that they trusted. They could speak their language and they say, you deal with them. And then from Montreal, we'll deal it to New York. And that's it. So we had enormous, enormous power in that, that sense. And, uh, the first real big commission that Montreal had, it was called SECO, Commission SECO, 1972. And then we found out that the, the Dubois clan, which was a French-Canadian clan, brothers, I think there were eight brothers. Yeah, a bunch of brothers, and a lot of the gangsters of the thing, you know, infamous gang. I mean, I, Ken, I don't mean to jump. You, you no, know, no, don't, don't go for it. Uh, absolutely. You're the expert on that point. No, <laughs> you're more of an... I just, I no, 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 no. I'm, I'm an expert. I'll tell you. I'm an expert on the construction. That, uh, uh, believe me, I'll, I know my stuff. But this is, is just... I just want to put it at the table so everybody understands yeah. what Montreal is in the, the perspective. Of I just heard... I don't want to say I'm an expert on the Dubois the family, but I just, I've heard a lot over... The time that I've been um, studying this stuff and researching this stuff, as that was a real breeding ground for a lot of infamous gangsters uh, as young aspiring criminals that eventually went into different groups. The, Absolutely. the Italians, the Hells Angels and the West End gang, a lot of them started underneath the D Dubois family. Uh, Dubois also lent a lot of money. You know, they yeah. lended a lot of money. So automatically, a lot of people came and see them. You know, you, you want to finance a project or, or a war or, a, you know, a, 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 cri a, cr a criminal uh, state. They were like, they weren't a affiliated with, they were like a self-contained. Exactly. And, and the Seco exposed them through real life and exposed also the Italian mafia. So, you know, both of these people were under the table. Nobody, you know, everybody knew they existed, but they say, oh, they're minor league, they're this. And then slowly and surely they say, wow, these guys have much more pull than we think. They have much more uh, strength, much more money, mo mostly much more organized than anybody thinks. So that was the first time that really the government 
the police started putting, you know, their claws. And don't forget, I don't want to go really deep into this, but Montreal exists, the mob or criminals exist mostly because we don't have a RICO law like in the States, you know? So we, uh, a guy, who uh, Casper, we met, there's 24 murders that was around him, all right? They couldn't put 24 plug him, but 24 murder, he's out already. Do you understand? <laughs> it, it, it would never have happened in the States. He'd be there for 400 years or whatever it was, you know? Yeah, he got so, home about a, a year ago, yeah. and he did 12 years for... A, a conviction on, I think, thirteen murders or murder conspiracies. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. So it's basically a year, a year of murder. And yeah, exactly. right, and right now he's, according to my sources, he's Marty Robert's kind of number two, uh, and kind of a war general right now. Casper the Ghost will met. Uh, it, it guaranteed, he's in the mix. Absolutely guaranteed. Like I told you off air, this guy's in a very intelligent man. Don't look at him and think he, you know he's a dummy. He's and uh, Marty. To the what people say about him, uh, this guy takes a lot of information. He's very smart, and uh, uh, they're they're here to stay. You know, uh, there's di- a very dysfunctional mob maybe in the states, but here. It, 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 they're trying to take over even the Italian mob. You know, don't forget there's Salvatore Cazetta, which was a hell's age. He's a bit older, but him too. You know, he was part of another gang, and he became a right hand man of a lot of people. So he just got he just got raided, yeah, uh, yeah. like a month or two ago. Uh, yeah. I'm not in the way, not to digress, but yeah. <laughs> it's interest. It's interesting how in Canada a lot of times you can look to be arrested, but you're not really arrested. They detain <laughs> you. They tell you that we're getting you for this, this, and this. Then they let you go. And sometimes it never reaches charges, which is kind of different, different here. Like if you get raided and they find stuff, like you ain't going home that day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here you're raided, you know, you're raided and uh, go home within 24 hours. It's a, uh, the car, uh, the, the lawyers are already at the police station to get you out. So it's, it's a, it's a bit different and it's, it's more liberal. It's more social also social. I, I call it the Cuba of the North. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to go into politics, but uh, you know, it, it, it it's there. 1974. It's the first time really that construction hits mainstream. There's a dam, a huge dam built in James Bay up north in Quebec. And we see that the site is completely ransacked and it's controlled by a leader. His name is Dédé Desjardins. This guy is part of the FTQ. He's a leader. Later, this man, you know what happens to him? He gets killed by Mambouche, or we think it's Mambouche because yeah. it's the last meeting, last meeting that they have. This guy was later the pawn shop king. He was in diamonds. He was, and, and in, in 1974, why did they stop it? It's because he was getting in their meat. He was making money off extortion, off bribes, uh, off everything. Everything that was coming into that Bay James Everything that a little percentage passed through his hands. So he was making a fortune and he made a fortune and he was a union leader of the FTQ. And this is the first, first time we could say, really, do we see a major player in the union being not uh, not arrested because he wasn't arrested. He's just told to leave the FTQ. But this is the story, the history. After that, 1975, we have our first real commission on the freedom of association in construction. Here in the, in Montreal, here in Quebec, 100% of workers are unionized in construction. Okay? And to make you understand, there's 600,000 FTQ members in Quebec, and 37% of the population of, of Quebec is unionized. So that's why I told you we're socialistic a bit, you know, and construction has 100 percent. So if you have power in the union, you can do 
enormous thing. You can shut down a job site. You can do whatever you want to. And a lot of these investors were scared of investing after a while in Quebec because of that, because the unions themselves uh, just became too powerful. You know, sometimes sometimes that's what happens with uh, with power. You know, you just you just take over and you don't care about anything else. And that's what we had to get rid of. But the FTQ uh, started, uh, and in 1975, Commission Clich started to expose this. What's kind of funny is that the two biggest prosecutors in that in 75 were two prime ministers that became prime ministers. So it's Brian Mulroney on the federal side and Lucien Bouchard on the provincial side. These guys were friends. These guys exposed everything and gave them notoriety. So they became a later big players in politics. And in 1976, right before that comes, right after the Commission, we have the Olympic Stadium built, right? It's been three years, four years they're building it. And to this day, it was estimated, oh, don't forget, 1976, $1.2 billion. <laughs> so, you know, and this is where all the stories come out, like, you know, trucks. Cement trucks coming in from one side, leaving on the other side, coming in the next 60 trucks, just doing, coming in and coming out, coming in and coming out, controlled totally by the mob, you know? Yep. The, so so that's what you see it. You you see enormous, enormous amounts of money, enormous amounts of, of union pull also because everybody is in it. The contractors win. Yes, sir. The set, we're talking about this, the 1976, I just want for people to yeah, understand. 76 the 19, Olympics. 1976 Summer Olympics were hosted by Montreal. And just to put it in his, you know, historical context, this was the first Summer Olympics after the Munich Games where there was the horrific Absolutely. Uh, hostage situation and murder of the Israeli hostages and so forth. So this is four years later, and this is like... As it as important of you know in terms of optics and uh, this is an, as important of an Olympics as had been in the modern era, and there was like you're saying this was commerce for like the whole decade of the seventies and just <laughs> exactly. easy pickings for people in the world that you were in. But what's really important also is in 75, there's a commission, right? So you say everybody's going to watch themselves. Everybody's going to say, wow, you know, we, we, we had a, just a commission, so we, we better watch out. We just had James Bay, which was tugs destroying, closing down the roads and all that. So 76 will be much better. Well, it cost the taxpayers 1.2 billion, maybe the most expensive building ever, you know, around. So, and it was... I'd say 60 to 70% was total, total corruption. Because, like I said, the cement trucks, but the wood, uh, the workers, they, uh, instead of having 2,000 players on, on the field, there was only 600. But two, the 1,200 were still being paid and were in bars in the left and right. There was cocaine everywhere on the job sites because 2,000 workers, a lot of guys uh, take that drug. So who's around that? The criminal minds, you know, all the guys were accepted, approved by the unions, you know, to go work there. Well, you know, a lot of them were making sidelines. So it was a free for all, a total free for all. But it showed what Quebec was really, you know, Quebec yeah, is a great, like I said, but it is, it, it, it's almost like going into a dark room. And when you, you hear a bunch of steps everywhere and when you open up your flashlight you see there's a lot of cockroaches you know so you see what's happening you see, you know what's happening only when it's exposed if not you're always in the dark and you always say oh i, I really didn't know oh, i worked here oh, i don't there, there was crane operators cranes that were put in the middle of the olympic stadium that had no motor and they were charging, you know, 500, 600, 700 dollars an hour. So it was no motor. So they never worked for years, not just for one or two. So that shows everybody was involved. The engineering firms, the workers themselves, the unions themselves, the contractors, and the government, because they had so these machines would never work. There's one machine, particular crane, never advanced in two years. Think about that. So, so you know, it's just just a, an optics. So you understand. May in I ask 19- something? Yeah, I want yeah, to ask for something. sure. Uh, at this point in the seventies, 
were the Hell's Angels involved in this kind of corruption yet, or is this still primarily the Italians, like specifically uh, 76 and the kind of construction rackets you're talking about? Montreal 76, I'd say 90% is the mob. Okay. Now, Hell's okay. Angels didn't actually okay. come to uh, Canada until 77. That was when they oh, that's so when that's they right. patched so, over the I, I'd say that uh, I'd say them uh, the hell is not the the bargem or the, you know uh, take the the power of it from them. They're almost like the street gangs of today. So they were the muscle we could say a bit later, you know. So really, the mob was the number one crime families. You know, they controlled everything, and I even say that the. The Irish mob was a bit even stronger than the the Hell's Angels at that time. Okay, okay. Be, because of because of the ports and all that. Sure. Just just to uh, yeah. again to, to to clear it up. Not so the Hell's Angels officially did not become president until seventy seven, but there were a lot of clubs. Yeah. That were like Hell's Angels proxies, or gonna be you know would become Hell's Angels proxies and. Groups like Satan's Choice and Popeyes, yeah. those were formidable biker clubs that I'm sure had interest in the union to a degree. They just hadn't become Hell's Angels yet. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. But I, I didn't talk about the Popeyes, but I'm just I was just giving you an average of you. The question was, you know, construction, I think it was maybe 90, 80, 90 percent guaranteed it was the mob. The rest, you know, uh, it, 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 there weren't big uh, there weren't big players, you know. And wouldn't but, you would you also say that it's like I've heard people say gambling, bookmaking is the wheel that organized crime spins. And I think that's true, but I think that's only telling half the story. I think gambling on one side or on one part of the pie, but the other part of the pie, I think for at least the last 50 years, probably in America dating back longer, labor racketeering, union racketeering is probably right there. With, with Absolutely. Gambling. I think so. And don't forget, huh? One goes with the other. You know, you, you, you have the unions who control the construction sites. The, the mob is there every day. So why not have a gambling book uh, around the workers? You know, hey, you know, you're, there's football, there's hockey, there's baseball, whatever. So uh, for sure, for sure, a lot of these players were there. And now, uh, mostly because of the Internet, you know, uh, we don't know. We think it's big, huge corporations. Yes, behind some huge gambling sites. But the the, the mob is still there and they're making a lot of money with this. Yeah, there was that big bust in Ontario not long ago. The Hells right, exactly. They, they were running. A, it was astronomical, the amount of uh, money through that uh, illegal gambling ring. Uh, exactly. I'll go a bit more into the uh, the government also, because the government also plays a little role here, because every Italian little bar that, that was around my house, you know, I have seven, eight streets, I could say I can name them all, you know, they had just one or two machines. Right. And the gamblers would go there. It was always the same people. It wasn't outsiders who went to those bars. It wasn't women. And now all of a sudden they use the government used the pretext of give, taking away two machines in every bar to bring a lot of Quebec in, in place. And now they have every bar has five machines. You know, everybody can play. Uh, women and men get free coffee and free seven up if they go play the machines and all that. So they replaced one with the other, you know, and uh, we can go further in there, but you know, I, to me, my experience is uh, government has done a blind eye in a lot of these things. They could have solved enormous of these things, but they were making a lot of money with this. They were making enormous money. And like I said, at the beginning, uh, the FLQ, this was uh, La Fédération Libération du Québec, a Liberation Federation of Quebec, uh, something like, you know, the Black Panthers at that time. Well, at one point, they killed a liberal minister, was Pierre Laporte in 1970. And that guy, Pierre Laporte, was supposedly very tied up with the Catronis at that time. 
So it, it, it's a wheel that spins, you know, and there's always the same players and I, they always just turn around and they're always there for the money. In 1983, the Solder Fund is created. Today, it's worth $17.8 billion at 753,000 shareholders. And like I said, 600,000 FTQ members, 37% of the population is unionized. There's five unions. And Quebec in the construction area is 100%. I was told so many times, I'll give you an envelope. Get the fuck. Sorry. Get the hell out of here. No, you can swear. We let I can swear? swear? Yeah. Well, okay. But he, he told me clear. You know, and it, when I didn't listen, they would send me con, <laughs> construction workers to say, listen, or union construction uh, delegates or uh, business agents or business managers say, Ken, could you stop? Uh, you know, harassing. I'm not harassing. I'm just going to get, <laughs> I want my man to work there. And right now it's not my trade and that's it. And they would throw me envelopes. So as if this was the way to do it, you know, throw you an envelope, get the hell out of here. You'll be happy. Your workers won't work. So I saw this right from the beginning. I said, if they throw an envelope to me at my start, what I did, what have they done already to the other people, even to my coworkers? Because if you try with one, then you try with another one. So, and that, that's what it is. And the FTQ, the Solidarity Fund, was a great model. And it still is a great model. You know, it's helping out to uh, enterprises in Quebec, you know, to have money. But the game was to infiltrate the Solidarity Fund. It's and analogous is- for American mob watchers to the central state pension fund within the Teamsters. For all those years where every racketeer worth their salt in the United States was trying to get a piece of the central states pension fund. This was like 20 years, 30 years later in Canada in 1983 in, in, you know, Ken's neck of the woods, they start this, what was known as the solidarity fund, which was like the central states pension fund on steroids. Exactly. But you don't, it's Louis Labert, the first FTQ, uh, President and he started to help with the help from the government because the government gave him a tax haven of about 35%. So when you invested two thousand dollars, automatically you would get back a bit of money. So, but you couldn't have you couldn't uh, have a uh, a place like a, a bank. So the, these were the, the rules. You couldn't take the money out before the age of 55. Uh, it, it, there's all these rules. But, so that's why the Solidarity Fund went up really fast because I think the initial investment was a million dollars. So it's just to show you, you know, 17.8. Eh? And it's legitimized. You, eh, everywhere, everywhere in Quebec, Solidarity Fund has its clause. You know, in the medias, in, in, in the construction, yes, but in in, in uh, pharmaceutical companies, they invested in everywhere, and they're partners in everywhere. They go 50-50, and then slowly and surely they go down. So if you're a criminal mind, you want investment, and you want to le- legitimize your thing, Solidarity Fund, if you have somebody in there that's very close to the mob, well, it's going to help you. Of course, they didn't want to lose their reputation. So that's one of the reasons why I became uh, somebody, uh, persona non ingrata. <laughs> they didn't like me <laughs> too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry. In 2004, so we were skipping up, or going up, Vito Rizzuto, alleged mobster uh, godfather, uh, faces charges, goes to prison in the States, you know. What's funny is, like I said before, my case agent or the case agent, the, the, the cop who was at the head of the Charbonneau Commission was Nick Milano. And he was the one who's coming to get me every morning, bringing me to the Charbonneau Commission later. Later, during the Charbonneau Commission, a little story, four cops who used to eat with me while I'm, while I'm uh, at lunchtime, you know, while I'm waiting to, for the break. Four of these cops are eating with me. And... The internal affairs comes into the restaurant. They all take them and they all bring them to a polygraph because their partners was one of the most corrupt policemen in Quebec was Benoit Raberge. And Benoit Raberge was infiltrated A to Z with the Hells Angels, gave them information, gave them every every type of uh, 
uh, information that could help them escape or get out of it. So it was kind of funny that I was at the right place at the wrong moment or at the wrong moment at the right place. I don't know what what you say, but the cops that were there, there was no there was no charges against them. But the, because they were partners with him. Uh, when they arrested this guy, Benoit Abelge, automatically these guys were stopped, taken, and brought to a, you know, a, a polygraph machine or whatever they did to him. I, I never knew. But uh, it was just exactly during my, my period uh, of questioning uh, that week, week and a half that I had at the, the Sharpening Commission. In 2011, 2005, I think you talked about this already, Giovanni, Johnny Bertolo, a union rep, John, died, got killed. And that is uh, such an important aspect because he was the number one guy of Renal Desjardins. So, can John, can we kind of. Yeah, uh, yeah, anytime. Let's any, unpack uh, that. Cut so, me off anytime you want to. No, I don't, I'm sorry. I, no, I, I no, a, no, 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 don't, don't worry. I have a it. bad habit. I get. No, you don't. No, no, no. Comments all the time. No, it is. I got to work okay. on it. Okay. okay. Uh, but. <laughs> I, I want it's true. I want to. This is like to me, this is maybe the most underrated murder or situations or circumstances surrounding said murder that truly might have been the first spark, the first fuse to be lit in what became this insurgence against the Rizzuto mob. And like you said, Vito Rizzuto is locked up in 04. He gets extradited in 06. He's fighting extradition for two years. But in between him getting locked up and him being extradited, he allegedly orders the murder of Johnny Bertolo, who was a union guy, who yeah. was very, very close friends with Reynard Desjardins. And People that I've spoken to said that that one incident, that one murder, turned Desjardins against Rizzuto. Absolutely. And set the stage for the insurgents uh, that started a couple years after that. I, I'd say you're 100% on it. I, I think this was the, the reason they, they hated each other, because he was in prison. He didn't understand why they didn't contact him. Johnny Bertolo was killed. It wasn't, ta it was taken. It, it, I, I think at one point when he came out of prison, they didn't even give him his, his route. Uh, they didn't give him his area. So they, they were already playing with uh, Renal Desjardins' good friend. And uh, I think this, this was the start and maybe the end also of the Rosuto clan, because, you, you know, know it, did you know Johnny? No, but I knew his brother because I met his brother because he was working for Renal Desjardins and he was working at a crane company. I met him at a huge crane company. And the first time I meet him, uh, I'm talking to a guy called Louis Pierre Lafortune, who is a major player also, very close to the government, very close to Casper we met, very, very close to uh, Renal Desjardins. And he's the middleman between Jocelyn Dupuis, which is going to be the big entree coming up. And, and, and when I went to meet him, it's because they told me, listen, you got to straighten out your act. You got to start knowing who you're playing with. Uh, you're, 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 you're attacking players that you don't even know. And I said, listen, it's been 30 years. I'm in the industry. Never met these guys. Never will meet this guy. I'm in the industrial. I'm not in the residential or the commercial or the civil. So I don't know why. And that's when I met him at that day. I met the brother of Johnny Bertolo and I met, I met him. And this, this is, this is a, a certain way to tell me, listen, you're playing in the major leagues now. You're not playing in the minor leagues. Stop acting like if you know it all. So that was my, my first. And I saw Renal Desjardins for the first time. He was sitting down in that office. Didn't say a word. Didn't even present himself. I saw him later because I met him in a hotel because uh, I went too far. This was, <laughs> so, this was after Johnny's death you had this? Oh, absolutely. Before. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, no. Wait. Johnny, I, ne I never met Johnny. I never no, met him. It's you. interesting that you were... You were called to a meeting with Desjardins there and Bertolo's yeah. brother there. 
Absolutely. After Johnny got killed and they're telling you to toe the line. Yeah, I'm going to tell you another story, which is kind of funny. Radio Canada, uh, a station, Canadian station here, you know, uh, 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 CBC. CBC had a show and they're do- it's called Ankai, okay, Inquiry. And they're trying, they have a lot of stories about what's happening, you know, about construction being done, buildings being built. Uh, half of the buildings are sold to FTQ members. Half of them are sold to the mob. That's where uh, Tony Suzuki buys a place. Joe Closer buys a place. Eddie Brandoni buys a place. So everything's around this. So this, the, the brother of Johnny Bertolo meets me and he says, you know what? Could you, could you make me meet uh, CBC journalists? I'll do as if I work for the solidarity fund because i really want to find out where they're going so that's how crazy it was happening you know he was telling me to go and meet the the journalists from inquiries when his face was plastered on the wall so it was like it, it was surreal to me so all these guys started because like i said i'm in the industrial side but around 2007 8 I see them constantly around me. I see cops around me. Cops are following left and right because they're saying there's two. You went to meet three guys. And within three weeks of meeting these three men, they got shot. Then they heard my name on wiretaps. And they say, they came and see me and says, Ken, who are you? What are you doing here? Why are some of these people talking about you? So I have no idea. You tell me. They didn't want to tell me because they said, if you become a police informant, if you relocalize yourself, well, we'll tell you and we'll protect you. And I said, listen, in good English, I said, fuck you. I didn't see you in my life at all for 20 years. I haven't seen you. I live in the neighborhood, but I know these guys, but I don't know at all their businesses. And all of a sudden, I'm now in the major leagues. Now, all of a sudden, I have to meet you guys and I have to give you some some info. So I said, no. And this is when I went public. And that, in a certain way, helped me enormously because, you know, instead of having a gun to my face, maybe it was only a camera. <laughs> so so it was, it, it, to that, it was a relief. Where there was major players that uh, opened up because, you know, when when you're not public, uh, people start talking about you, you know, start saying stuff. And the FTQ, a lot of the leaders were saying that I was a police informant. So they were putting my life in danger and s- the, some of my family. They were saying also that I was working for other unions. They were saying that I was working for CBC. CBC was paying. So they started all these bunch of rumors. So I said, I have to stop this because, you know, so that's why, by luck, I met Renal Desjardins. I met a lot of these guys who I started telling them exactly what I'm telling you. He says, listen to me. You never heard of me before? Why all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden I'm important. I'm not important. The only thing I'm telling you, and I told this to Renal Desjardins in his face. I said, listen, Jocelyn Dupuis, when he drinks a bit, tells me he's at the table of six. He's everywhere. He controls everything. He's part of the mob. He's part of the hell. He has this. He, listen, at one point, he was sitting down with Ducam Joseph in a restaurant. I don't know if you know him, but Ducam Joseph was a street thug of extreme danger. One of the most dangerous men in Montreal at that time. And again, it was meeting me. So I can give them an opening at the Solidarity Fund. So the only reason I was important for the mob is stop harassing our guy who controls our openings at the mob. And, but if you want to be part of us, tell us. Because we're going to give you cash. We're going to give you power. We're going to give you everything you want. And it went up to also uh, telling me what I wanted. In money wise, and this is where Louis Pierre Lafortune offered me three hundred thousand dollar bribe, where 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 the Solidarity Fund would a the we could say the legitimate side offering me, I, I want you to be the CEO of Quebec Alberta Fund, which is a branch. So I'm a union director, 
And all of a sudden, they're giving me all these, all these favors and all these, uh, these places. For about three months, while I was using all my power against a, a huge, uh, the biggest director in the FTEQ, which was a scientist, nobody spoke to me. They wouldn't even take a, a, an elevator with me. I was, nobody wanted to even sit close to me. The second I met Renal Desjardins, the next day, everybody was talking to me. So I knew exactly who was the boss, right? Think about this. You know, you have a union that has enormous power in just in the construction side. It's, it, it's un, un, uncalculable how, how much power we have because don't forget, we place the men. Big difference with the states. We, we can put 50 guys who know the job and we could put 50 of our worst workers so we can eat up a contract. We can, you know, time and material, we can destroy almost any contractor who comes in and bids on a job that he wasn't supposed to bid. They call, you know, the thugs, the union guys, and the union guys will say, okay, I'll send Joe, Mario, and Tony, and he ain't going to do shit for that week. So, you know, you're going to eat your, your, you're going to eat your contract. And don't forget, my contracts were huge. You know, they, we're talking about, 100, 200, 300 million dollar contracts. Uh, it, it, they're, they're not just little residential places, you know? And just, uh, I'll go back to a bit to, uh, I don't, I don't want to go from one side to the other, but uh, Casper, we met, what he wanted to do is to control the brick. So the residential, he wanted to control all the cement. So he was pushing. And through this, we started seeing that the, Mafia itself is losing a bit to the Hells Angel, even at that time, because in St. Leonard, there was never a contractor other than an Italian doing the cement or doing the bricks. And when Casper we met was there, we were seeing more and more French Canadian contractors doing stuff in areas that they weren't supposed to. So uh, just as an outsider, you could see who was taking over. The Montreal. And, and, and it's, to me, it's very simple. It's the age. You know, you're getting older. You're getting older. You don't have recruits. You don't have, the, your sons are not in the business. Your daughters aren't in the business. So slowly and surely, you're, you're being pushed out. And it's exactly what's happening here in Montreal with this big war with the mob and the Hells Angels and, you know, and with the other, uh, the other groups that are much younger, much more violent, who just want to take over and they don't want to pay the respects or the, uh, their, their, uh, you know, whatever their dues to the, to the Hells or to the mob. So it's interesting that there's this, this, um, corrupt infrastructure in place. And if the Italians start, um, to lose power, the infrastructure doesn't go away. It's just meet the new boss, just like the old boss. <laughs> the who? Of, right. Exactly. Instead of an Italian guy, it's now a Hells Angels member. But otherwise, the infrastructure continues. The machine continues. Absolutely. And it's just a perspective, right? You want to go see a public servant. You want to go see one guy wears a suit and the other guy wore, you know, a uh, 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 a biker, a so uh, that that's that's why it's just the, the perspective of how you're looking at it now. The Hell's Angels do not wear their vests when they're doing event, you know, you know uh, their contracts. They 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 have evolved in something much bigger than we have, and maybe it's it, it, it's just uh, that's mafia. A Marty, that's a Marty Robert shit. Exactly. Ma- I, mafia. I would I would say Nergit too. I would. Yeah. No. Nur- to- I no absolutely Nergit and Marty. Absolutely. Who are the, who are the Absolutely. brain trust know that it's good for business. And, and if, if they have completely remodeled this group in the, in the past 20 years from not to say that it's, they still don't have bloodlust, but they are much more business oriented and getting into nooks and crannies of commerce that they, they hadn't before and doing it stealthily like you said, without wearing the paraphernalia, the way it's Marty, really, yeah, you know, Marty's it's, a chameleon like that. 
It's Rizzuto 2.0, in my opinion. You know, yeah. they, 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 a chameleon is a perfect an, 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 an analyst. It's, it's exactly that. And they know exactly uh, to go into these major projects, mm-hmm. to get into these major projects. I'm just talking about the construction. You need to have a face that will, will, will sell, will be sold to, you know, to these huge law firms, to these huge engineering firms, to these huge accounting firms. So and they're, they're mainstream, they're getting there. And uh, with these people, these they're very intelligent, they, they know what they're doing, and the laws help them also because they're not as severe. And this is where I'm getting into. In 2006, there's a huge project called Project Colise. So it's a major police operation targeting traditional Italian organized crime. We don't know much about it because till this day, the wiretaps, the surveillance tapes to major players, to, to, to politicians, to prime ministers haven't been sold. And we, we don't know why. It hasn't been able. We at the public inquiry at Charbonneau, we asked them. We had to sue them in court to get some aspects of the wiretaps and the uh, and the surveillance state. And this is at the Charbonneau Commission where we see Justin B with, you know, Casper we met. We see him with, we, we see him with uh, um, Israel Lemon, uh, Jacques Israel Lemon. We see him with a bunch of Hells Angels and we see him with a lot of, uh, of people uh, that are from the criminal uh, mind, you know? So this is when, the first light really opens up and saying, wow, this is La Commission Clich 2.0. We're re-seeing this all again. But now with much more money, we're seeing they have infiltrated the Solidarity Fund. They've infiltrated legalized uh, jo- uh, uh, jobs. And uh, one of the places that they really want to go into and this i'm telling you it's going to be everywhere in north america it's uh land masses decontamination decontamination is the future <laughs> in organized crime yeah because governments sell you a land for a dollar and then they'll say you have to decontaminate it, and we estimate it. It's ten million, fifteen million, twenty million. So it's a way to buy it and resell it, right? What happens is there's a there's no real huge um, system around this. So I can be a pretty good guy who goes there, takes some carrots from the from from the field. I judge it's six million. I judge it's two hundred thousand dollars. It's very different. So we have all these problems that are going to show up more and more. There's going to be a huge amount of trafficking because the government, some some uh, officials, and organized crime because the percentage of of money to be made in land and like one former construction guy who was very close to the mob says buy land. God doesn't make it anymore. Right. So, uh, to, to just add to your yeah. point, what I mean, Ken is, you want to talk about someone that that knows their stuff. I mean, I don't need to tell you that or tell the audience that it's clear over this first 50 minutes, but he just hit it on the head in terms of one of the major, major factors going future, uh, going into the future in OC with the the uh, the, camp, the the decontaminated land deals. You saw this in the big 2016 case out of New York here called the East Coast LCN case, uh, which took down like five different families across the. But within that indictment, in the Joey Merlino part, the the Philadelphia mob boss who got caught up in that doing stuff with with the Genovese, a bunch of Merlino's guys that he had been connected with through the West side were doing this exact thing that, that uh, uh, Kenny just uh, talked about. And I'm pretty sure one of the guys that was um, Brad Serkin, I think who was a guy that pled out and was driving Joey a lot down in Florida. It was a Jewish guy from New Jersey. I think he, uh, he was like running point on a lot of those 
I'll have those operations. Absolutely. And listen, it's devolved. Huh? All the mob through North America has controlled a big, huge part of the garbage industry, right? So they're just evolving and they're going to decontamination, which is garbage. It's taking the recycled land and putting it somewhere else. So, and these major players, we have huge, huge players who who are affiliated very close to the mob, and they're they're taking land. Here in Quebec, there's a, a huge story because I was invited to be an expert witness, and it was Blainville. It's a city up north. And what they did is Montreal expands, like New York expands, like Boston expands. What do you do? They take the contaminated land, and they put it up north. They put it in other places, and they fill it up. And they put cars in it. They put bicycles in there. And then 10, 20 years later, they build communities. So these communities find out that they start digging. Do we want to put a pool? They want to put something. And they find out that their lot is like a cemetery of contaminated articles. So they want to sue the government. So they want to sue the city. But it's the city itself that put <laughs> those articles in there because they were selling it. To the best bidder, you know, instead of paying a thousand dollars a ton, I'll give you an example. Well, these cities would say, All right, come and put it in my area for 200, 300. A lot of these landfills were controlled by who? The mob or people very close to the mob or to the Hells Angel. So it's this, this thing that goes round and round. The government doesn't want to say anything. Because they surely got caught, caught in this. A lot of their officials are associated totally with the mob. And uh, this is what's building. So that's why I'm saying the decontamination aspect, it, it, it's, it, it's the future. They're making billions of dollars. And they also have something, and you guys live it in the States also, is we have an agricultural area. Near Montreal, right? It's at the 45 cents of square foot. Well, you know, hell, if it becomes residential, industrial, if it becomes another thing, well, it's going to open up at three bucks, four bucks, five bucks. So they use the decontaminated thing, not to sell it to some people because they say you'll need to decant, sell it to the other ones, their friends, their friends decontaminate it at their level. And hey, listen, there's so many stories. I can I, I just on the contamination, I could spend an hour there's because a, there's a yeah. field of um sorry to interrupt, but there's a no. growing uh area of academic research on this because this has been going on in Italy for a long time. And Absolutely. so there really is no decontamination at all. And it, so they talk about in U European yeah. scholars talk about the eco mafia and uh crimes against nature. And so, yeah, this this has been going on for a long time. The mafia's infiltration of recycling and decontamination, which there really there really is no like they're not really doing like environmentally sustainable. No, they're not contamination. It's so, paperwork. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, paperwork. Right, right. That's all it is. You know, they're just changing the numbers and say, yes, we decontaminated this at ninety percent. They're saving millions of dollars because they bought the land for a dollar. So you, you see the game, you know. And then they this install. Is real, this is a, sorry. To, I mean, I don't want to digress too much, but this is you know a real crisis in Italy because they're fucking up the land there that they use for like, uh, you know, for olive oil, you know, for like vineyards and and yeah. uh, the uh, uh, buffalo mozzarella, <laughs> like um, you know, food is you know agriculture is very important to the Italian economy, and they're they're really fucking things up there by by polluting the land. So, you know, it's pretty it's pretty serious. This isn't like fucking guys who gamble too much and who cares if the mob is, <laughs> you know, like you're fucking up Mother Nature now. Absolutely, I, I, I think the stakes are different. Absolutely. And yeah, you, exactly what you're saying in Italy. I mean, you, you, you can, you know, they learn and they adapt. So one person starts it, you know, Sicily might start it with the olive oil, remember, and all of this. And then they just adapt it to other, other products and they do the same thing. And it's 80% of it, it's fake olive oil, you know, and it's the same thing what's happening here in Quebec. There's so much fake that when you, you, your whistleblower, you open up, you become the target because they don't like, that you're giving them more information than the cops, than 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 the the corporate lawyers, or who defend these huge companies. 
That's important to understand. You know, they're they're there. So uh, that that's the whole game. Then in 2011, I'm going, I'm digressing, but the Charbonneau Commission starts. It starts. The government in place is the liberal government under Jean Charest, and they really don't want to have it. We're more there in power. The liberal government was the, much more in power than any other government. So they made roots with a lot of people and with the mob, etc. So the Charbonneau Commission starts, and it's an inquiry on awarding and management of public contracts in the construction industry. So when I went there, they told me, Ken, tell us everything. So I said, okay, I'll tell you everything. I told them everything that I knew, an exposure, but, you know, before. Be, but they started telling me, okay, this, you can't speak about this. <laughs> this, you can't talk about this. This, don't even, put, don't even put your hands on this, okay? Well, I want you to focus just on the union. So right there, I was kind of, and you know, it was really, really aggravating me because, you know, you want to know the whole story? I'm going to tell you the whole story. Uh, now, because it's your friend, you don't want me to talk about it. You know, uh, in Montreal, there's a saying in the union, my two biggest leaders had a direct link to the prime minister. So it was like, you know, uh, Jimmy Hoffa had a direct link to uh, John F. Kennedy. You know, uh, think about that. You know, you could phone him at any time, at any hour, and he, the answer, and you tell him, listen, uh, uh, there's an inquiry against me and all this. And it went so far that some union directors knew that they were wiretapped. So they started protecting themselves. So who gave them all that information? It never came out. We never knew. We knew that the, he knew that he was wiretapped, but we didn't know who, which police or public servant or whoever involved. So it was becoming more and more a, a bigger, a bigger, uh, you know, nail in their toe. Uh, and to start, they were so focused on the show business part that the public inquired the first testimony was from Joseph Pistone, Joe Pistone. Yeah. Johnny so Brasco. Johnny when, you, when you told me that, I was like, are we talking about the same person? And then it yeah. made sense. And then it made sense, actually. Exactly. So he, he came, he was the first man on this on, on the witness stands and he explained the whole story. He spent there a day and everybody clapped and said, Thank you very much. And uh, so it started with the Joe Pistone opening act. And he's still on the web. If you see him, you know, Joe Pistone uh Charbonneau Commission, he speaks in English and they translate in French. So and uh, and 2011. Jorénal Desjardins gets arrested, charged with one-degree murder for shooting Salvatore Montagne. I meet Renal Desjardins maybe a month before because he tells me, listen, Ken, you can come and work for me. I sell high-end doors. <laughs> doors, you know, for high-end houses, yeah. you know? And I said, uh, thank you very much. And, uh, I, I, I'm pretty polite, you know? <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. I don't know. And the guy who set up the meeting is now today the union boss of the whole FTQ. So just think about that, you know? That, so the guy who set up the meeting between me and Renal Desjardins is today the highest ranking member of the FTQ who has a seat at the Solidarity Fund. So we... we, we, we you can't make we, it up. You couldn't make this up. You couldn't make this up, exactly. You sit down with these people. It, 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 you, it's the same as the old boss, like the Who song. It's exactly the same. So, you, And they become better at it because they weren't arrested. Nothing was done. We had a, a, a mayor who got caught. It was a Gilles Vianco, and he's from Laval. And this man, listen, when he was caught, when the cop showed up, his, mother, his wife, which was about 75 years old, was shoving dollar bills in the toilet. <laughs> Million, hundreds and hundreds of dollar bills in the toilet to get rid of the evidence. So it's almost like a movie. It was, it was surreal. And this guy, Gilles Vianco, well, you know, he went to prison for about, I think, three years. We know that he put money offshore. And life goes on, you know, and all oh, we've cleaned up. And the guy who took the place of Gilles Vanco is a cop, an ex-cop, and he got arrested also. Montreal, another cop, another mayor got arrested also. So it, 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 that's why I want to say to people who listen to me, like, uh, if you really want to clean up, you need to have people, 
you need to have shows like you because I believe that the camera is much be- much stronger than the gun. The gun will kill you and it's the end of it. The camera will stay. The video will stay on. It'll keep on. It will continue and continue and expose these guys. I could, I could talk an hour about all of these men, you know, all of them. But it's just to show you how it was important that uh, when I exposed them, uh, the strongest, the most the most influential union boss in 10 months took off. I had a little story for you, if you don't mind. It's just, oh, yeah. uh, aside, aside. I knew that there was a lot of um, receipts that were fake receipts. Okay, so uh, this is how I caught Just Lane's uh, He was doing hundreds and thousands of dollars a year in expenses, okay? He was spending $2,000, $3,000 in restaurants every day whenever he wanted to, and nobody was doing nothing. Everything was approved because the union was, you know, the executive was part of the plan. They never got arrested. They still stayed there and all that. So what I did, I said, I knew about this because some guy tells me I'm part of the executive. The guy tells me this and says, I can't do nothing because he's going to shoot me. But if you want to get him, get him through the books. So it's almost like, Al Capone, you know, you want to get him, you get him through your money laundering, you get him through anything. You don't get him through the crime, but you'll get him through the money. So what I did is I took a picture of the filing cabinet. I bought one in Amazon. I bought the tools to open up and I down, I brought it to about a 45 to a 50 second. I could open up all, all the cabinets. I took every receipt from the two, six month period. I caught him with 150,000. I caught him with a bunch of other things and I gave it to the I gave it to the to uh, uh, CBC and they exposed it. I didn't give it to the cops because the cops wanted to keep it. This is what's incredible. They didn't want to expose him. So I gave it to the journalists and the journalists within a week showed it within a month after that he was gone. Yeah, from uh, the what I the research I did before the show was that was the the real concern that you, the people that were against you had was uh, that you were going to go to the media. That that to them was they were more fearful of than than going to the cops. That they didn't seem as worried about. It was that you would you would tell journalists about it. It, it, te- it tells a lot, it doesn't it? Doesn't it show a lot? Listen, you know they they all scared. They, they put so and. You have to understand how incredibly influential because while I was at the commission, I gave about 50 to 60 stories to everybody who wanted to hear it. So I gave them to this low local newspaper, to the highest local here, French, English, all of them. And at one point, there's a high-end uh, Solidarity Fund member who was going door to door and saying, if you take stories from Ken Pereira, we will not give you commercials from the Solidarity Fund, which gave them about eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars, you know, uh, per uh, for that period. So it's just to show how much they were using their influence. They're strong arming the media to say if you use these guys and you use this intelligence and you use these stories, well, you know, we're not going to do commercials on your on your site. We'll go somewhere else, and then and they 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 were able to influence some some people they influence a lot i had a film it's just a little i had a film there's a production company says ken we're gonna do a movie this is better than the godfather so i said yeah yeah all right thank you very much appreciate it it's a great story and yeah that's why i was that's why i was laughing (laughs) well well, i heard i heard you were you know part of uh you uh you were part of a a director, uh, you were the the experts uh, during that. So, you know, so you can go, you understand what I'm going to. And I tell them, listen, I know that you guys had money from the Solidarity Fund. This is a big production company. So the woman there says, Mr. Pereira, I'm going to tell you something. I am the artistic director. I am influenced by no money. Two days later, she told me, oh, the project is cut. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of funny to me you know that she got on her high heels telling me all this bullshit and then two days later well it's gone it's over it's over a, we don't we don't want to see you here anymore i had a front jimmy knows this without naming the publication i had a front page not front uh uh what do you call them uh yeah i guess front page or or a cover a cover mm-hmm. story uh with one of the big major magazines 
around here. It was called The Empire Strikes Back. Um, it was all about the Detroit Mafia in kind of the modern day. This was like probably 10, 15 years ago. And uh, I I went in there. I helped them with the cover. It was like the Star Wars kind of theme with like mug shots. And it was like it got cleared by illegal. And then I got a call one morning. Like, yeah, the whole thing's getting thrown out because of some major businesses around here that are owned and controlled yeah. by members of LCN who in this one particular magazine was taking a quarter to a half a million dollars a year in ad revenue. And they called and said, if you run that story, you're losing that ad revenue. And it, it went away real, real fast. It wasn't even like, we're going to think about this. Right. We're going to debate it. It was like, all right, kill it. And these are the best stories because it's to show to people, you know, how everybody is intertwined, you know? And even, I had a story that my son was was uh, uh, do, doing dishes. I forgot, uh, what do you name man? He's 18 years old. Like he's a doing dishes. A bus boy. A bus boy. You're right. So he goes to the restaurant and he's doing dishes. And this Italian owner says to my son, he says, could you bring your father here, please? So my, my son says, uh, uh, hey, dad, this guy wants to see you. So he says, thank you very much. He says, listen to me. What you did with this guy is honorable. But I want you to know he was spending $2,000 a week here. So, you know, you understand the counter, what happens, you know, so you do the right thing. But at the other side, you're killing a business because this guy was spending two grand, three grand in food and with his friends. So he was just wanted to tell me, listen, I understand. And I, uh, I, 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 I agree with you, but I just want you to understand that there's collateral damage to all. And that's why nobody speaks. That is such an important aspect that people understand because there's law abiding citizens. There's real people. There's real, but they got their job on the line. So they can't speak. A lot of, I had 16 directors who said, temporary, we're behind you. We're with you. The second the mob went to see them, all of them left. <laughs> it was kind of funny even. You know, today I can laugh at it, but all of them left me. And they not just left me. They said I was the problem. It was, you know, a Stockholm syndrome. They went, they they contacted, you know, they became the friends of the ones who are kidnapping them. So it was like, it was surreal. It still is because there's a an nomerta. Nobody wants to talk about it really, but it's still there. They just changed they change the players, you know, they move the bit of the thing and they're refined. They're better. They're stronger. You know, six million dollar man. <laughs> That's what it is. Thank yeah. you so much, Ken. Uh, this was this was truly outstanding. This was a, just an excellent. I know it's a little long, but uh, I, I think it needed to be. And and I was on the edge of my seat this whole time. So please, uh, let's everybody just, uh, you know, thank Ken for coming on and, and telling us that great story and and his sharing his life and his role uh, as a, you know, a, a mob buster, somebody that is, is, you know, fighting the good fight and has such great insight and has such great perspective. Hopefully we'll, you'll come on again and, and maybe we can chop up some more stuff and talk about some more of these people as they kind of uh, jump back in the news and Absolutely. maybe get your insight onto them. Um, Jimmy, Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate yeah, just, it. Uh, thanks, Ken. And then please, you know, like, and uh, subscribe, like, subscribe, share. Follow us, spread the good word, and we'll, we'll look forward to bringing you more content. For Jimmy and Ben Behind the Glass and our special guest, Ken, Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, we're out. <laughs>